Can I tell the story? The first time I ever met you, which earned my undying respect for you. Oh, sure. Last fall, I'm driving up to Staples to source well, and I walk in at five minutes before. Where is the instructor? Learned out that we had a little wire crossing in Camp Ripley. We learned very quickly how fast you can drive from <laughs> to Staples. I am like so impressed. Like he called me along the way, told me what county road you were on. I'm like, oh, I know where that is. And you walked in and like you started teaching immediately. And was, we left on time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I still tell us, I think it was incredible. Well, so I, I, I love this guy. This is great. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm going to let you really, Andre, tell you a lot more about him. But you're, you're, you have done now a couple of trainings for us, um, I think, over the course of the years. Uh, now is the Chief Diversity Officer at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, but has a, a history of teaching here, especially, I think, a position with Anoka County. And then you are an author and do the other, you know, work with other groups as well. But we're happy to have you here. You're actually going to be in another training, I think, this afternoon. Up in yeah. 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 So, yeah, I don't know if you want to have people introduce them. We're a tight, cozy group. But, yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, we certainly will do that. Yeah. Um, so, awesome. awesome. Let's get to Thanks it. for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, just a, a, a tad bit more about me. Um, and it's training. So I have never been a police officer. So I can't tell you how and what that what that is like. I've had interactions, uh, and so I can share those things. I think one of the things that we do have in common is that we're uh, we're all human beings, and so that's the the approach that uh, that we'll we'll take today. We're to talking about what our humanness can offer us. Um, so there's that, and uh, yep. So. 
It was at Nook County for uh, for about eight years, seven years, um, doing or maybe six years, uh, doing great stuff. It felt like maybe seven. Um, doing great stuff there. Um, taught middle school, high school, college, um, graduate school. So I've been in that kind of education space. So. Um, so there's that, and we'll know, we'll, we'll learn more about each other as we kind of go through this training. So one thing I, I'd like to do is uh, have each of us kind of um, give our name, and it, obviously our, our department, and most of the departments I'm familiar with, but Crystal and your big lake, is that right? Okay, cool, cool, cool. And, Crystal. Oh, Crystal, okay, cool. Um, and Blaine and Maplewood. Maplewood, all right, cool. So, um, yeah, so, so you bring your name and your, um, a story about your name. Okay? So, so like either how did you get your name or the story behind your name or what your name means. And even if you don't, if you don't have something that you think is good enough, you can make it up because I wouldn't know the difference in anyway. Right? <laughs> so, um, would, would you mind going first? So what's your name and then? Dave Plum, I'm the commander over the investigation. Um, but if my last name is Norwegian descent, I am probably not. I was adopted, I was put up for birth upon, um, put up for adoption upon birth. We owned by the people of Minnesota for a couple, two and a half years, lived in a group home in South Minneapolis, was adopted by a farm couple of four. So if you see my parents, my dad is about five, two, and <laughs> my mom is about five, yeah. so you, you'll see that there's not a great deal of <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. that that's a powerful story. A powerful story. Right? Well, you call that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Danny. I'm going to preach. Um, and uh, my family originally was born in Denmark, in Europe. My family was born in Europe. Not much else about my name, I guess. My first name, we have a tradition in my family with the first born. Son always takes the dad's gift. Gift takes dad's first thing to put him. Oh. My name is my dad's name, my son's name, my name is my name. I don't want to make any better. Okay. Sweet, that's cool. That's cool. Well, Stephanie Murphy, which is the first one. Remember the show, Heart of Hearts? Yeah. Stephanie Collard, my dad loved her. Who did it? Right. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, my last name, Reverend, is German, actually. Uh, my dad is actually a 50% Italian, 50% German, my mom's a 100% German. Uh, I'm Brian. Uh, happy to meet you in Crystal. And um, a little glimpse into my dad's chemical uses. As a young adult, uh, there was a pretty heated argument. This is this the story. The story right. There was a pretty heated argument in the house when it came time to name the firstborn. My dad wanted to name Bonville. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my mom doesn't know exactly why that was. <laughs> However, it was. I mean, I, you know, I grew up as a 70s kid, and so Bozo the Clown was right. which I don't think there was a relation, but I don't think my dad connected the dots that that would have been the the childhood story. <laughs> yes. If, uh, my mom wouldn't have won the one Thank God for mom. Go mom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sam also in the lake. Um, I think that's my mom. Yeah, my grandpa on my mom's side, Sam and David. And we were down in Fairmont, Minnesota. And my aunt, my mom's sister, was up in the big lake. And about a year after I was born, they had a son, and they named their son Sam and David as well. And with their last name, not with David. Uh, a couple of years later, we moved up to the big lake, so my cousin. Sam was always known as Little Sam, and I was Big Sam, and now he's bigger than I am. But everyone's always struck for a while. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, Andrew Wittenberg, and the last name is spelled B-O-R-G, so I grew up with Whitten Borg, and up until last year we thought maybe there was some Scandinavian going on in there, but you know, the family member did the whole 
ancestry thing, and come to find out there, we can find the guy in Germany who moved here, and all the things that happened along the way, like the different spellings, and the different religions, and the different, all of that stuff. So I actually realized that the, the cemetery in which I played cops and robbers, I have ancestors buried there that I never realized, and it was blocked from my house. Wow. So we recently discovered were there. So then I was like, please get be done. And That's done. cool. I thought you were going to say you found out with 23 and me that you're African. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, That's a real. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> You're part of that popular name of the of that son. Yeah, so my name is Andre Cohen. I was saying that's my grandfather, whose name is Kurt Parker. And um, so my mom won the, the battle of Western and uh, and so uh, but she did not think I looked like a bird. So she took his middle name, which was Andrew, and the thought of me being called Andy was not something she was looking forward to. So she dropped the W and I ended up with Andrew. And I also lived in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, I was born in Ohio, state in Ohio. And um, the folks at that particular time weren't very sophisticated. So my middle name was supposed to be uh, Mikhail, like Mikhail's name, like the television show. Uh, unfortunately, um, the closest that the folks could get was uh, Michelle. So my legal name is Andre Michelle Cohn, which makes me seem very, you know, uh, Neapolitan, right? So, uh, so I, I roll with it from, from time to time. So uh, if you ever see aliases, it's not that I have an alias, it's just that, you know, whatever. So, um, so cool, cool, cool. Now, um, Hopefully, you can tell that I'm prepared for a conversation around um, kind of diversity and inclusion and cultural competence and all that kind of stuff. Because I, I have a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, at the top of that PowerPoint presentation is a, uh, is a link. So if you have questions or comments that you may not want to share out loud, you can get on your, <coughs> you can get on your phone or your device and click that and ask the question or post uh, uh, a thought, and I'll see it here on the screen here. So, uh, so it's kind of a private thing if you want to be private, or you just sit you know, Andre, you went too fast by that, so you know, let's come back. Um, I can see those notes right here. The other thing is, um, so you are the executive leaders in your organization, and so uh, it does me no good to just run through my stuff without actually helping you solve problems or address issues in a critical way. And so I want to be that platform for you. Again, I've come prepared with stuff. We can talk about this, thing, but more important are the things that as, as leaders of, of individuals in your, in your department, I want to address your concerns uh, today as best I can. And so, um, are there some things that you were hoping we might talk about or that you'd like to talk about given the, the space that we have uh, today to kind of talk about diversity and the cultural competence and all that kind of stuff? Is there anything in particular? Well, I'll speak up and say my assignment for being here essentially is to sort of preview and see if we want to bring you to our level of department. So I would want to talk about bias specifically and how that can influence uh, you know, decision making and how to protect them with that what sort of real not theoretical but real things you want to do to either be made aware of it or to be a little more conscious and make sure we're being able to get any matter that We read a lot of jobs that feel like an hour. We do this and there's both standards and everything that way. We have enough energy to try to invest in that. We want to look at more kind of our existence and how we focus on our existence. So we need to come to the society to be one that empowers to get through the existence that we need to do this and that. So 
much emphasis on that. It's not good racist, but I can see how people will be good when they look at the law enforcement lawyer both reactively with it. And I took an example where you could use the choice of doing it. But we're reacting to the call, and we have like a higher percentage of um, with minority population. And so it, may, it presents as law enforcement as a big problem, where it's largely what we're doing is reacting and getting our staff to recognize the explicit bias that people in the community have to, where we you see two people playing with the bike lock, you know, getting the figure of any time. Who they call nine one one on that and 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 recognizing that we've got to recognize that as one of the not just in itself but it's the relevance of that in society at large. Yeah, I was uh doing some stuff with um, preparing for this new set of sessions around situational awareness. And uh we will address part of that in in, in our conversation today. Uh, but there, there are some things that we need to do. We need that the common person may not necessarily see things that they like. So, um, Chief, um, Chief Nguyen, hey, hi, how are you? Come on in. Um, was, uh, when he was at Columbia Heights, was somebody that I, I respected and whatnot. And we did some community interactions because. Um, one of the local churches, I think it's a church of all nations, that's right on the border of Columbia Heights and um, whatever, whatever. Uh, so Columbia Heights, whatever. So they had a large um, uh, Hispanic population, and the, the population of the, the, the church felt that the police were targeting them because they were Hispanic when in fact which the police were targeting them because of violations of vehicles that were associated with being lower on the economic scale and blah, blah, blah. So it was more, more uh, but one of the things that uh, was really interesting is there was a, a woman in her, uh, and I'll get to more of your questions in a second, but so part of my job is to help the community understand the work of police and then help officers understand some of the purview of the community. And one of the things that was said in that conversation I thought was really impactful was that the, um, there was a mother who came in and said, you know, we called the police and I will never call them again because they came yelling and shouting and da 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 And, and um, one of the, the officers there, Officer Nightingale, said something I thought was very profound. He said, ma'am, why did you call us? And she said, because he, my sons were and da 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 He said, did you have control of the situation? She said, no. She said, ma'am, when, when you call us, you call us because it's out of your hands. It's out of your control. So we come in to take control. And that really that really helped reframe for me kind of why things happen the way they do. So I um, so thought that was, that, that's important kind of to your, uh, your point. Other things to would like that you can talk about or have um, some, some concerns about or ways I can be helpful. Um, I 
Yeah, I'm just curious about how things have changed and evolved since the last time I heard you speak, which was just months ago. But uh, it seems as though it, they we're in a society there now where it doesn't take long for something to become very polarized, something that may seem like a year ago or two years ago would have just kind of run its normal course, and now people have gone to their corners, and it just seems like it's, it's much harder to kind of even reach a kind of a consensus in society about how, you know, and this is part of the media narrative around, you know, sort of about, you know, I'm not talking about just police, but in society in general, yeah. because it seems like police are on the receiving end of a lot of conflict. There's just a lot of unhappiness out there, and you know, he, he, he just said, sometimes it's just a false dose of like, I can sort this out. Yeah. Can I close this door? You can actually, yeah. And the guy that, you know, I guess he ain't even wanting to know out there, so eventually he'll maybe want to back in. But... And so, who, who, who are you? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, right. I'm, I'm the chief right here. Oh, what? 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 Wait, wait, wait. Tell them your name and everything. Yeah, we all have to tell them. He's got it. Yes, what? my name is Sandy Young. Know, and. My mom gave that to me. I don't know what's going behind it, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is she like you? I hope so. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. That worked out. She likes you, she likes me. All right, cool. So, um, no, the reason I closed the door is because I wanted to have a more kind of closed door kind of conversation. So, um, so in, in, in terms of my personal journey, so we are so very polarized, right? And so I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really concerned about that because I'm, I don't know that we have uh, leaders in place in any position that are prepared to do what it takes to bring us back together. And so um, I'm afraid that that polarization is going to continue. And as we start looking at a new election cycle, I think it's just going to be exacerbated. Um, and so there, there's a guy that I've been listening to, and I disagree with this guy, and I disagree with him on a number of points, but one Thing that and you're going to see a couple of quotes that at, at least I encourage you to just listen to. Okay. His name is Jordan Peterson. I don't know if anyone has heard of him, but I've been reading and following some of his stuff. And the, the thing that's scary about the things that he offers is that it is absolutely so practical and, and, um, and in many ways counter everything that we've been taught. So I'm going to say something that sounds very controversial, but I want you to, to, to think critically about this. Um, so part of the reason there's this thrust to uh, to have these types of training is because of the death of Philando Castillo. Um, and if uh, if folks don't know, that's part of the thrust of the statement here that kind of gone on too. So um, from a number of different sources. The, the, the whole situation was questionable from the beginning, and how people feel about that is whatever, but the state has said, because of that, we want to enact these, these, these things. So when it comes to this idea of, of uh, implicit or unconscious bias, I think, personally, it's cool. I think implicit and unconscious bias is cool. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, I, I, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. I do believe that it exists, but the but using it as a rationale for making decisions is irresponsible at best. Right? Um, as as a body of of law holders and protectors, do we believe that people should uh, do, should people get what they deserve for what they have? In, in most cases, we can say yes, right? So th there's other places where we can offer mercy and other kind of stuff, but for the most part, uh, people deserve, uh, they should, should get what they deserve. Um, simultaneously, so, so one of the things that um, is offered by, by uh, Mr. Peters is this idea that we are accountable for what we do, right? So my dad was a pastor. He uh, he was a Black Panther, and then he um, saw that being a Black Panther was not was not profitable. Like there was no insurance plan, and the and the health plan for revolutionaries was not you know not a, a good one. And I don't think the Panthers understood the weight of the United States on the neck of revolutionaries. Right? They, they didn't understand J. Edgar Hoover's reach and power. Right? And so, um, so he left the Black Panthers and became a uh, Pentecostal fire and brimstone preacher. Okay? 
Um, and so I grew up with this kind of political activism in my life and then this really strong spiritual stuff. And so, uh, so you may hear things that sound like preaching and it's not my fault, it's my father. Right? Uh, simultaneously, you may hear things that sound political and they are because I have a, a, have a political leaning and it's called the Constitution of the United States. So I, I lean upon that. And one thing I would encourage you is that if you are interacting with, uh, with a trainer or training to bring those in and they don't bring up the Constitution, what they're selling may be questionable, right? Because that is a document that separates us from other nations and allows us to have the, the, this conversation, right? 17, um, uh, 1776, the Constitution, I mean, the uh, Declaration of Independence was, was penned. And they said, we hold, these, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Wonderful words. Anybody disagree with those words? Okay, cool. No, wonderful words. Simultaneously, as that is being inked and penned, what is, what is also happening? Slavery of specific folks. Right? Slavery of Africans being brought to America, slavery of indentured servants from Europe, typically the, the, uh, the Irish were, were brought in, um, the Slavs were brought in as, as indentured servants as well. What else is happening? So we have that one again. What else is happening? We're taking land, we're taking land from? From the indigenous people, right? From the from Native Americans, right? What what else is happening? So we ju we just ended the the the, uh, the Revolutionary War. So those words that were written, who were those word, words written for? Who can participate? White who? Male property owners. So who's not in the picture? Women aren't in the picture. Yeah? So as beautiful as this picture is, there's a lot of people missing. The majority of, of white people who were in the United States at that period of time, were the majority of them landowners? No, it was a minority. It was a minority of individuals who were landowners. So the, the, the general masses were people who couldn't participate in this beautiful thing that we call the, the, the republic. I'm not trying to uh, retcon um, history or, or whatnot, but I am asking us to think critically about what we're trying to do. Because what people try to sell you on is this diversity stuff that is based on guilt, shame, and blame. But you should do this because you owe me something. And you don't owe anyone anything but to love them and to make sure that the Constitution is uh, prevalent in their lives, right? They have access to the Constitution as it, as it pertains to, to their lives. And so when we talk about this kind of stuff. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, implicit bias and, um, and cognitive control. So um, I said my dad was my pastor, right? And so one of the things that, uh, and I grew up in the 70s, and in the 70s there was a show called The Flip Wilson Show. And I don't know if folks are old enough to remember that show or whatnot, but it was the 70s versions of Medea. I don't know if people are familiar with Medea. So it was a guy who dressed up as a lady, and, and he thought this wasn't a, a new thing. This is an old thing. Milton Berle like started this whole dress and drag and make fun of women kind of thing. Right? And so, uh, so Cliff Wilson um, started doing that. And one of the things that was unique about the '70s and '80s show, if you wanted to have a hit show, you had to have a catchphrase, right? So catchphrase is what is what made shows, right? So does anybody know what show this catchphrase was from? Um, a happy days, right? Uh, there's another one. Dino my good times, right? What you talking about, Willis? Different strokes, right? Right. So all of those shows had these catchphrases, and so Flip Wilson's show was very much the same. And um, his character's name was Geraldine, and Geraldine would find herself in these kind of Lucille Ball kinds of convoluted you know, interesting mayhem, right? And so she would find herself in all these situations, and then when they would get resolved, the question would always come, um, Geraldine, why did you do it? 
And the, the catchphrase was, the devil made me do it. And then the laugh track would come on and then they'd fade to black, right? Um, so, so I would find myself doing things that my father didn't want me to do or just you know, being disobedient or, or just being a kid, mischievous, right? And, um, and so I, I tried that one day with my pastor father. He said, boy, why did you do that? And I said, the devil made me do it. Now, I, I don't know if you can imagine what might happen as a result of, of me claiming that the devil dictated my behaviors, but my father uh, ultimately did not find that to be a, a positive response. And so um, in, in your own household, do you think your parents would have gone with this idea that the devil, something outside of yourself, compelled you to, to do something like that? They would beat the devil up. <laughs> right. 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 right, and I'm not condoning violence, but, but that, the times were different then, right? And so uh, when we talk about implicit bias, oftentimes we let that sit as if it is enough, when in fact what we need is cognitive control, right? Um, I don't know about you, but um, many people are afraid of spiders or snakes. And, uh, and for me, it's mice, but not, not the mouse itself. It's the scurrying of the mouse. It's the little, you know, ah, that, 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 right? Um, so as long as it's still or it's, you know, I'm good. But it's the whole scurrying across the floor. It's just, ugh, right. So, but I have to have cognitive control, right? So I can't lose it every time, lose it, right? Lose control, lose my composure every time I see a mouse that, that is turned across the floor or I wouldn't be able to be affected. The same goes for this, this bias, this implicit bias that we have. We have it, but we have to be in control of it. And we have to be in control of it because we're human beings. We are homo sapiens sapiens, the ones who know they know they exist, right? So uh, if any of you have those um, Apple devices, right? What's the icon for, the, for those Apple devices? It's an apple with a bite out of it. Does anyone know what, what, the, what the, the ramifications of that are or, or why? Why would they choose that? They are, in fact, going back to that, right? So we bite knowledge. So the, the, the devices that have the apple on it, it the, the iconography suggests that we're eating knowledge. Right, that, we, that this device allows us to take in and have more knowledge. And so um, that's part of what it means to be human. But when we're not thinking, I would suggest and I would argue that we're not being human. One might be able to argue that. So, um, so a couple of things. Um, our agenda and outline so that folks can see what, we, what we've done and what we've covered. Um, here are the, the major themes. So uh, culture and context, we'll talk about this idea of cognitive control. We'll talk about our paradigms and blind spots and, uh, and the brain, how all those things kind of affect the brain. So here are some truths about life. Life is hard. It's hard. Right? You're born as a baby it, through a hard process. It's a, it's a difficult process. To be born. You are born into an environment that is a harsh and hard environment. Life is just hard. To that end, that's hard, that's that's difficult to try to have conversations about, right? Because we believe that life is beautiful and blah blah blah. I, I have a friend who's Eastern European and we were talking about uh, a beautiful horse, and she wanted to know what is a beautiful horse. We went, like, what do you mean what is a beautiful horse? You know, we described a horse. And, and she said, you know, where I'm from, um, a horse is a horse. It is a tool. It is something to, to be used. It does work. We don't ever see them as beautiful, right? Um, and I would suggest that, that life is hard. But the beautiful thing about life is, how, is figuring out how to navigate through all that difficulty. Right? And so what's the nature of, of the difficulty of, of life? So first... Um, there is fear. And what, what do all humans fear? We fear the unknown. Right? We fear chaos, disorder. So uh, a, a lot of times, you know, in, in the community, people don't necessarily understand what that blue line represents. It represents the, the barrier between those two things. 
right? The, the barrier between chaos and order. And we, we walk that line, we stand on that line um, to protect people from, from fear. At the same time, sometimes we lose focus as, as, a, as a group of people, as human beings, on the impact of how we sometimes walk that line. So we're protecting people, we're making that division between, between uh, chaos and order. So the, the nature of human beings is always to move towards something, right? So we're moving towards something. Um, our ancient ancestors started moving towards something. And when you move from here to there, what causes someone to want to move in the first place? So, so there's some kind of incentive, whether positive or negative, right? How many of you have moved out of your parents' houses? Why? Yes. To do your own thing, to be independent. So, so you were pulled, or, or in some cases pushed, to a bear, right? So oftentimes here becomes, here is suffering. If I stay here forever, I am now suffering. And so people say, or, or, or what, how people choose to move is to move from here to there with the hope of what about there? That it's better. Right, and all, and and so if it if there is better, are there many places I could go? Are there many there's that I could go? Right? Can I choose all of those there's? No, I choose one. Why? So it could be resource time because I find value in that. Right? I find that value in that that particular there. And so what that also creates is a hierarchy. And so when we start thinking about implicit bias, we think about cultural competence, in our human interactions, there is always a hierarchy that gets formed, which means if there's a hierarchy, that means that there are things, there are the haves and the have-nots, the do's and the don'ts. And so diversity becomes an, an important part of just recognizing that this is how we operate as human beings. I know this is a little esoteric, but we'll get to some meaningful stuff in just, um, in just a second. So getting there is difficult, and staying here is also difficult. Okay? So life is, is hard. So what I'd like you to do on your, um, on your uh, the front page of your um, handout is to write down five values, five things that you value. One, two, three, four, five. So there are five circles, write down one thing that you value in each one of those circles. One thing that is of value to you or important to you. So it could be uh, having, yeah, concept, justice, freedom. Five things that you value. All right. It looks like most people have four, if not all five. Let's play a game. The game is very simple. What I want you to do is I want you to find two people in the room um, who share or have one of the things that you have down as a value, as their value. And so if you have things, Things that uh, that are similar, like uh, I have nephew, and you may have father that's similar. So I'll sign on that. Um, if you have uh, things that are um, uh, that you agree with, you see on someone else's paper, and you agree with it. Uh, I want you to sign that too. You say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. All right. So I'll give you. Uh, so that's two signatures for each one. So you have. Uh, five circles, five values, two signatures for each one this means you'll have a minimum of how many signatures? Ten. A minimum of ten signatures. All right. So uh, you have ninety seconds to do that, starting now. Oh, I'm supposed to sign hers. 
Seconds. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> Well, I can Thank look you. that way, but it seems like the focus. Yeah, no, the focus is over here, and this is kind of a bizarre little thing. Um, All right, good. Uh, good, good, good. So, did everybody at least get one person to sign your paper? All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, anyone get at least three signatures? All right, uh, five signatures? All right, seven signatures. All right, anybody get more than seven? All right, how many, how many signatures? Uh, I have two, four, six, eight, eleven. Eleven signatures. There's only seven people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they can sign more than one oh. more time. She, she tried to catch you on the map. You, you were helping her with the map. <laughs> All right. What are friends for? Right. So, um, so anyway, more than eleven signatures. <laughs> All right. So there's always somebody who messes up the grading curve. So I appreciate that. Could you tell her I won? Yeah, yeah, yeah you tell her I won. You know, you didn't win. Didn't win. <laughs> so, uh, so as you, as we're going around the room, what did you? Uh, so first of all, uh, did you see something on someone else's paper and you were like, oh, why didn't I think about writing that down? What were some of the things you saw on someone else's paper? Faith. All right, so you can't say that at the same time. Right? So faith. What else did you see on someone else that you said, oh, I should look at that. Passion. Passion. Right? Respect. 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 Integrity. Cool. Were there things that were difficult to find someone to sign on, or you don't have any signature you wanted at all? Was there any? I have help on mine. I, I have two signatures. Okay. Surprised by health. Mm -hmm. All right, please raise your hand if you value health, even if it wasn't written on your paper or you didn't sign it. All right, cool, cool, cool. Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Please raise your hand. Yeah, please raise your hand. I value health. I was going to say, if you value competence, please raise your hand. If you value competence. I think I signed everything else. I was like, all right, I can't sign them all. I can't sign them all. All right, cool, cool, cool. One more, one more. That, yes, please, second. Right. Safety. safety. All right. Please raise your hand if you value safety, even if it's on the spectrum. You know, okay, cool. I know some of your risk takers. So why, why, what do you think I would start with an activity like this? What do you think is behind this activity? Yeah, it helps to demonstrate that we are far more alike than we are different. Um, and so one thing I'd like you to do is, somewhere on that paper, is, is write this new or different definition of diversity. One that I think is more helpful. Is that diversity is the recognition of our commonalities 
and our differences at the same time. So I am, we are very much alike, but we are also very different. And those differences, I might refer to as obstacle illusions. Obstacle illusions, artificial barriers to authentic human relationships. So, so we are very much alike and we're very much different. And what I think is interesting is that um, folks try to fall into two camps and it's, it, 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 it's not a helpful thing to fall into these two camps. There's the rugged, rugged individualist that says, I did everything by myself and I can do things by myself. And then the other group is that um, we are totally 100% collective. I am not, I don't exist without my group and I need my group for existence. And I would, I would suggest that we, we live in the spaces in between there, right? That we are uh, responsible for our own behavior and our own reaction, but we also are parts of groups that uh, particularly when government gets involved, tries to navigate those groups, right? So, um, so when you look at those five things that you wrote down, is there anything there that would identify your ethnicity or your race? Is there any one thing that, that you could point to and say, this, this demonstrates my, my ethnicity or my race? Okay, so most people are saying no, some people aren't sure, and that's fine. Um, is there anything of those five things that you wrote down that um, points directly to your gender identity or gender expression? No, no, right, okay, cool. Uh, lastly, is there anything there that the IRS would recognize as something that places you in a particular tax bracket? No, okay, cool, most of us are shaking our heads no. Uh, I don't know what some people have on their paper, but you know, if, you know, most of us are saying that. So, so why is it that when I ask you to write down the five things that you value, why do you think that, that race or gender identity or gender expression or social economic status, why do those things not show up in your, in those, in those five circles? We're bigger than that? What does that mean? I, I'm certainly bigger yesterday, I mean today, than I was yesterday in size. So, so what do you mean by bigger than that? Uh, my That aren't dependent on those values. Aren't dependent on those categories. On those categories, okay? Other folks. Again, you. Again, you have to do the one that they get. You know? Not that those don't matter, but if you do, but you just. You can't do it. Now you can do it. What did I ask you to do? What was the assignment? Write down five things that you value, right? I'm not suggesting that we don't value our race or gender or our social economic status. What I will say is that we value those things that we write wrote down on, on a piece of paper oftentimes more than we value those other things. And I would suggest that any person that we're operating with could probably we could probably find commonalities on those values. Right? Well, we can find commonalities on these values. What I would also suggest is that it is important to recognize that race and gender and uh, socioeconomic status is valued by 
by systems more than it is by individuals. Right? Systems value those things. Right? So I was born, but I wasn't born black. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not doing a reverse Michael Jackson thing. I'm. I'm okay. I'm not. I'm not on pills or anything like that. But I was born human. But America made me black. So, so the, the, the categories of, of race and all that kind of stuff have, have changed, and, and it's so interesting that I was born black. My my father was. My grandfather was born colored. And then my great grandfather was born Negro. Right? How how was that how is that possible? It, it, folks know a Ford F one fifty. If a Ford F one fifty is placed any place on the planet, is it still a Ford F one fifty? If it's in South Africa, if it's in Mexico, if it's in New Zealand, if it's in you know J Japan, it's still a Ford F one fifty. Why? Because that's the name that was given to it. That's what it is, right? But race isn't the same way. It changes from place to place. Did you know that, that uh, Canada has a different racial and ethnic categories than the United States? And the United States has different uh, ethnic and racial categories than Mexico. And Mexico has different racial and ethnic categories than Brazil. And we're all in the same hemisphere, right? So how is it? So what is this idea of race? And we'll tease that out more in, in, in just a little bit. But what I would suggest um, talking about race is that, that race may not be what we think it is. It is very real, but it's not what we think it is. Um, and so we, once we understand what it is, then we can use it more appropriately or understand how it's being used uh, in, in different ways. Right? So, um, so those are those five things that you got. So what, what I'd like for you to do uh, now is to look at the, the bottom of that page, and I want you to count the number of triangles in that, in that image. How many triangles do you see? And once you have a number, go ahead and shout that number out. Six, eight, eleven, What's that? What do you mean you don't see it? What would somebody say? It's our lesson. So, what constitutes a triangle? A three sided shape, right? A three sided shape. How many of those? How many three-sided shapes do you see in, in this diagram? How many triangles are there? No. So what happened? How is it that some people saw 11 triangles and other people saw no triangles? Better at math. Better at math. <laughs> <laughs> fill in the gaps with what we thought we were. And so this is the place where implicit bias lives. So it is very real, right? So we, this is called Gestalt psychology. And many of you have taken psychology classes and that kind of stuff. But Gestalt kind of psychology is, uh, is how and why icons and, um, and uh, uh, logos get formed the way they do, right? Because they, they speak an image beyond the image, and then we fill in the gaps. Um, so. So, so implicit bias does exist, but we have to take control of that, right? So let's talk about how and where. So in that larger circle next to those five values, what I'd like for you to do is to think of this as the pie of all human knowledge. Okay, it's a little melodramatic. Okay. Um, but what I'd like for you to do is to cut yourself a piece of pie the size of what you know of everything there is to know. So cut yourself a piece of pie the size of what you know of everything there is to know.
Right? So the tie is this big, and the gate is the side. So what are some examples of things that you know for sure? What do you know for sure? You know something because you're in this room, right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of people you can think of this room. What do you know? <laughs> that is a hard question. There are lots of things to choose from. Just, just three. You know you woke up this morning, right? What about cold? You know that it's cold outside, relatively, right? One more thing you know. Oh, here. Yeah, we're all here. All right, cool, cool, cool. So those are the things that you know. What I want you to do now is to cut a second piece of pie. And this will be the, the, uh, the size of what you know you do not know, what you are aware of that you don't know. So for example, I know that I don't know quantum physics, I know that I don't know Mandarin Chinese, and I know that I don't know how to fly an airplane, right? So those are things that I know that I, uh, I don't know. So I want you to cut that second piece of pie. Now, some of you will say, well, that's the, the rest of the pie. There's a third piece that we'll identify in just a second. So save room for that third piece. And the, the, the first piece is what you know. Yep, the first piece is what you know. The second piece is what you know you don't know. So what are some things that you are aware of the fact that you don't know? Car mechanics. Raise your hand if you also know you don't know car mechanics. All right, cool. Both my hands go up on that. Uh, used to be able to work on cars, but now they're all the computer just on that. All right, something else that someone knows that they don't know. Medicine. All right, please raise your hand if you know you don't know medicine and, and how to do surgery or fix something. Okay, cool. Right? So we have what we know, we have what we know we don't know, and what do you think that third piece of the pie is? What we don't know, we don't know, or our blind spot. So if you can write that word blind spot, the two words blind spot in that, that third piece. So if we put all of those pieces together, we put what we know, what we know we don't know, and our and our blind spot together, all that, that whole pie we might refer to as a paradigm. Right? So if you could write that word next to the circle somewhere, paradigm. P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. I used to say paradigm. I was hooked on phonics. It worked for me. Um, but as you, so, so what is a paradigm? Because oftentimes as leaders, we're asking people to shift or move or change their paradigm. What do we mean by that? Their viewpoint, their perspective, how they see things, right? Um, and so, Whose responsibility was it to give you your first set of paradigms, your first worldview? Your parents, your family, your guardians, the people who raised you, right? Um, some of us were lucky enough to uh, choose our, our parents or have our parents choose us. Others of us not so lucky, and I, I got <coughs> stuck with who I got. Um, and where did they get their first set of paradigms or how they see the world? From the same and the next generation also got it from the same groups right so have you ever received a copy of 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 a copy once you once it's been replicated that many times and you get this this this, this copy that's been you know uh, we used to say xerox back in the day right it's been xerox so many times does it look exactly like the original no, how is it different from the original? So in some places it's faded, it's blurry, there's dust on it, there's all sorts of stuff, right? Is it possible that the paradigm that you've been given is far from the original tension, uh, intention of how and why it was developed, right? Here's another example. Um, Brazil nuts. Right? Brazil nuts. Um, and, and I actually found that Brazil nuts are not nuts, they're actually seeds. 
So, uh, so a, a Brazil nut is, for those of you who don't know, is, is uh, about an inch or two inch long um, wood covered, kind of mahogany covered nut. And um, you usually find that around holiday time in the fall and in the winter. And it has another name. And people refer to this Brazil nut by its other name. And some people don't know that it's called Brazil nut because they use the other name. Are people familiar with the other name of Brazil nuts? No? No? Okay. So, so, uh, so some folks refer to those nuts as nigger toes. I'm not sure how they came up with that. I don't know if they were podiatrists or, or how they you know, became such an expert on, on the Negro toe, but, but, but that's, that, that, that's what they call it. And the people who used to call it back in the day when they called it that, did those people invent that? Say No, they didn't. They called it that because that's what people called it then. And so now, if someone were to call it that, what would we say to them? Yeah, that's inappropriate. That's not what we call it now. Why? Because it's different times. Paradigms have shifted. There is a reason that the dinosaurs are not here now in their classic form, right? The T-Rex. Ah! The T-Rexes are not here. Why? They couldn't shift with the context, right? And so when we talk about, you know, why are we doing this work? Why is it important to even think about this stuff? Because the context and landscape is changing. The way you do policing today is not how it is dramatically different than how it was done even 10 years ago, right? Uh, many of you, when you started your career, the things you had to know then and the things you have to do now is vastly different. You have to be, um, you have to be therapists, you have to be counselors, you have to be community mediators, you have to be, um, um, in, in, in some cases, uh, uh, the program is called PAL, but uh, mentors, right? I mean, so, so the whole aspect of the policing is dramatically different, but it's not just different because we just wanted, we didn't have anything else to do, but times are asking for policing to be done in different and new ways, right? So the context drives a lot of these things. So, um, so, so that's important. Let's do this. Let's take a, uh, like a three minute break, take a bio break, we'll come back and then we'll get into more meat. Right. Thank you so much for your time with me. Oh, okay. yeah. right on. Right there. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't bring my cup in. Oh, cool. Did it look good, it said? Mm -hmm. Was that done? Oh, I didn't catch that. Okay, I didn't know that was
Small little club. Um, so we'll, we'll get right to it. Um, how are things going so far? Good? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the motivations of human beings. Right? So if you go to page two, we're going to read out. So I, I do have some, and I didn't go through the, my presupposition at all, but I do want to kind of just throw this out here. It is my belief that diversity is good. That the, the mix of ideas and thoughts and approaches is good for problem solving. Does it mean that it's easy or efficient? It just means I believe that it is good. So that's one of my, one of my things. So I um, just want to put that out there. So there are um, four truths that I think um, we need to think about and address, that, particularly around human behavior. The first is that human beings can learn change as well. Okay? Uh, human beings can learn change as well. My greatest frustration when I taught, when I was a teacher, was not recognizing that this was true, even if it's not on my time frame. Okay? So people can learn, change, and grow, even if it's not on my time frame, even if I don't expect to see it. And so sometimes we'll, uh, I think recidivism is something that we should be concerned about, but we also should recognize that there's obviously something that someone's not getting. So if they keep repeating it, it's because they're not getting the it. Or they may be getting what they want from that behavior. Um, I have um, what we, we call um, um, incarceration for long periods of time camp in my family. And so I have family members who, who enjoy camp. And they must enjoy it because they keep doing things to get, them back, to get themselves back into camp. Right? Um, I also believe that there are some, some, some psychological and some emotional things that they don't get on the outside that they do find benefit on the inside. And so I'm not suggesting that uh, that is true about everyone, but I know these particular individuals have had some, some challenging experiences and I can see how that structure may be better, they find beneficial to them, even though they didn't get it uh, at what is that most of us would not suggest, right? It's, it's not our choice. Um, so people can learn change and grow even if we don't see evidence of it, right? So uh, all we have to recognize is that the process works. If I plant a seed in the ground, all things considered, I water it and make sure it has ample sunlight, I don't have to check it every five minutes. Right? Because I know that the process works. And at a certain period of time, if it hasn't worked, then I can go back and change and augment or, or do things to, to help that process. 
Um, second is that people do what they think works even when what? Even when it doesn't work, right? People do what they think works even when it doesn't work, but why do they do it in the first place? Kids falling out in the store, I'm sure you've seen them, right? Why are kids falling out in the store? Right, candy aisle, cereal aisle. What's that? Because the behavior is accepted. And what else? It's worked before, right? So the behavior has worked, manifested itself in this work before. Uh, people who are bullies, they are bullies because somehow, somehow they've gotten the, the, the idea that that's been effective for them in their life, right? Um, so when will they change? When they realize that it doesn't work, because it could be not working all along, but they don't realize it until uh, it just their behavior doesn't change until they realize that it no longer works. Right? Um, all human behavior is goal directed, and we'll talk about the goals of human behavior in just a second. Lastly, is this edit, this idea that attitude is a reaction to goals? What have we been taught about attitudes? What are attitudes? What are attitudes? Response to condition. Okay. What conditioning? Attitude. Anyone ever been told you have any attitude? What if they mean by that? It's usually not positive, right? <laughs> yeah, my parents would say stuff like, um, you know. Boy, I don't like your attitude. Go to your room to you learn how to act, right? But get my act together and then I step into the hallway and I'd say, to be or not to be. <laughs> you know, I spent a lot of time in my room, <laughs> right? That's not what they were talking about. Um, but it wasn't until I, you know, I was always a, a late bloomer, slow learner, you know, whatever. I, I was methodical in, in my development and, and whatnot. And uh, I finally didn't get where my parents meant my attitude until I was 17. So I told you before, my dad was my pastor. So on Sunday, we would go to church from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. We stopped at 3 o'clock for chicken, um, not because we're black, but because chicken is delicious. <laughs> so 3 o'clock chicken. Um, so Friday night, I asked my dad for the car. My dad loves me. What does he, what does he say? Friday night, I asked him for the car. He loves me. What does he say? He says, where I'm going, right? Does he give me the car or not? <laughs> depends on the answer, depends on the attitude. Uh, typically, he would give me the car without much question at all, right? Uh, I'd tell him where I was going, right? And so uh, my dad would give me the keys. I pick up my friends. We go cruising for girls. I don't know. Uh, we never found girls, so you know it's kind of a wasted trip. Um, but then I come home before curfew. I fill up the car. I give my dad the keys, and my dad says I have what kind of an attitude? A good attitude, a positive attitude, right? What do I say about my dad's attitude? He's got a good attitude too, right? So, so Friday night we're cool. Sunday. At noon, my best friend Dexter calls me and says, Andre, can you pick me up for the movies? What do I know about Sunday? Church all day. But I'm 17. I'm invincible. And Jesus is my friend too, right? So I go to my dad and I say, Dad, can I borrow the car? What does my dad say? Not only does he say no, but he gives me the hell sermon. The worst consequence in our household was going to hell. Neither you can go to hell on your own or my dad would show you the way. Right? As a result of that interaction, what happened to my attitude? It went down, right? I had a bad attitude. So what is an attitude? To what? All right, think about this. Anybody have a teenager in your life? Niece, nephew, son, daughter, grandchild, right? Uh, any, any situation like this ever happen? Um, Mom, Dad, I just got a text. Cindy's having a party. Starts in five minutes. Can you drop me off? 
do any, something similar to that, right, last minute kind of thing? And what's the parent's response to that? No, who does that? Nobody has a party of five and just, they're disrespectful for even doing it. And then the parent unloads. As a matter of fact, you haven't cleaned your room in the last week, and you and your brother and sister have been fighting. No, you can't go to this party. What's the kid do? Transformers. <laughs> Yes, boom, yes, right? So they go to their room, close the door like they own the joint, right? And then it, the adult is like, oh, they just unloaded on this kid for no reason. You know, Cindy actually does need my kid's support because she's doing this acting thing, and you know, she just needs, but her family's a good family. You know what? I'm going to let the kid go. So he goes to the kid's door, knock on the door. <laughs> the kid's like, what do you want? And you say, look, um, I, 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 you can't go to Cindy's party. Can't stay for the whole time. I'll drop you off. I'll pick you up at this time. We, we got to get this room straightened out, and we got to do some other stuff. Uh, get your stuff. Let's go. What happened to the kids? Attitude. For the most part, it gets better, right? It gets better. Why? They got what they wanted. So what is an attitude? An attitude is a side effect of something else. And too often people want to get us caught up in their, in their attitude, right? Well, she said this, and he said that, and I don't want it. And they get all of this theatrics, when in fact, what we should be focusing on is their goal. So when people get that goal, they have good attitude. So when I have neighbors who are, who are at each other, before I even pay attention to the at each other stuff, I should be asking, what are their goals for even being in a relationship with each other? So attitudes are the side effect of goal accomplishment. If people accomplish their goals, they have good attitudes. If they don't accomplish their goals, they have bad attitudes, right? So, so, so what is the, the, the goal of human behavior? And I would suggest that, um, Abraham Maslow says that there are five. I would suggest that we can boil those down to three. That people are looking for significance, belonging, and safety. Right? I don't care how many coupons um, a, a restaurant gives out. If they're not able to meet people on one of these things, those coupons do no good. Have you ever been in a situation where you get lousy service or whatever, and they just try to give you a coupon, but they never take what you have to say seriously? They never make you, they never resolve the, the court issue that the, 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 the white staff were disrespectful. They, they never uh, provided a, a sense of safety for you in that, in that space. Uh, anyone ever been in situations like that where you got coupons as opposed to actually having the conversation that resolves the real thing, right? Um, so significance is this, the concept that everyone wants to recognize, be recognized for what they can contribute, right? My significance is in the fact that not only do I exist, but I can contribute to the, the larger group of society or to my family or, uh, or to the environment that I'm in. Um, so significance is recognizing that I have purpose and power. I was born, I was, my birth was not an accident, right? Um, I was born on purpose and for a reason. And belonging suggests that I am in relationships with people who understand my purpose and my power, right? So I want to belong, I want to be in relationships with people who understand my significance. And safety is just the, the concept that I want to be in an environment um, where I can be in relationships with people who understand my purpose, right? So I can be mental, physical, spiritual, in, in environments of, of safety that um, that allow me to connect with people who understand my safety. Why do kids join gangs? Probably one of those three or a combination, right? Why do we go to work every day? Probably a combination of, of those things, right? I wonder how many of the, the values that you wrote in the first page fall under, either support one of these three things, or are a product of one of these three things, right? So our values. So what is the, what's the real problem with, so if, if a kid who's in a gang wants significance, belonging, and safety, 
And I go to work every day, and I warn you, significance belongs to safety. Where might we come into conflict? Me and the gang members. Where might we come into conflict? I want significance, belonging, and safety. They want significance, belonging, and safety. Where does our conflict come from? How we get there. Our method. So one of the things that we have to, to recognize and help help our, our staff recognize is that the things that I want as a human being are the same things that the person that I'm working with also wants, right? I've, I've heard this, and, and I think it's an interesting statement. And it, this determines how people actually see the world. People act according to this. It is better to be... Um, Tried by 12 and carried by 6. Do people know what that means? Okay, you've heard people say that, right? What is it suggesting? What does it suggest? So we can say to you more important than the last one. Unfortunately, in the community, this is how they experience the blue line. They don't necessarily see the blue line as this, the barrier between chaos and, and order, but they see it manifested like this, that it's better for me to cover my hide because it's me versus you as opposed to us working together to figure out how to solve some other problem. Okay? Um, So what's our first job? For well, anything else, every day our job is to go home at night. What do the people that we interact with also want? Go home at night. Right? Um, and so when we when we when we see the world like this, this dictates our behavior. And um, I'm not sure how you address that or how you talk about that in, in your uh, in your department. But I would encourage you to actually talk about that because I think this is a, this is an antiquated way of, of, of looking at, at things, and that um, we don't have to look at it, solve problems this way. Yeah. 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 Past year, two years from now, we can one of the things that we do is one of the biggest things that we preach you know, needs to be going well is the concept of the love working the eligible places to right? Yeah. And whether it's good or bad, Hear about that. You know, how would you that? And we are trying very difficult to use the concept of it because you're already clear with this time. So we want to try to solve the problem. So we want to try to a mission statement. It's conclusive that we are members of the community. So I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in the last place. That it's a whole and still look at reiterating as them. I'm not going to say versus us because it makes it more inherently, but it's really easy. Even if you're trying to talk about positive relationships with other people in the community, you're still creating a disconnect right after that. And I think we are working very hard to kind of change that paradigm. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I think that, I think that makes sense. I mean, um, I've seen, and, and I have to say, because I spend most of my time in the metro, I've seen that manifested more so in the metro than I have in, in outstate. I'm not saying that it's not happening in the freedom of so, um, But I know that that was um, Chief Medu, who was one of the, uh, the folks when he was uh, Chief of Columbia High School at Maplewood. Maplewood, right? And, um, 
was really trying to push that we are the community. We're not, we're not separate. And so, um, I also know Blair Anderson up in, uh, in uh, St. Cloud is also pushing this idea that we are the community. So I think you're right in line with, with what needs to happen in terms of how we start thinking about yourself. One of the things that Chief uh, Anderson was doing that I, I was like, what does this have to do with the community? But in a long, so I, I think about it like um, Apple versus uh, uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft took them, when they first went out the gate, Microsoft said, we'll take all the business stuff. And Apple, you can have the school stuff. Well, what Microsoft didn't recognize is that the school kids become school adults who have been trained only in using their stuff. And so that's kind of what they propelled Apple to do it. So, so, so what thing he was doing was they're doing some school, um, they're doing school lunch stuff during the summer. They have a whole program that the police department runs for for what to do summer. I was like, what does that have to do with this stuff? He said, think about it. First of all, if they're in our care, if they're with, if they're interacting with us in positive ways, that's going to pay off these benefits in the future. Also, at least that's one hour a day that they're not making trouble because they don't have anything to do, right? And I was like, makes sense to me, you know. Um, so anyway, um, so so there's that. But yes, I think this idea that we are the community, and to be quite honest, if we think back to um, to some of our, you know, if we look back at least to the 40s and 50s, these cops knew, knew the people in the neighborhood, right? We could have, you know, uh, police our communities were a lot small. I mean, there's a whole lot of other stuff. But there was this relationship that people had with other human beings, and one of those human beings just happened to be an officer. Right? So um, that's important to recognize. It's also important to recognize that many of those same communities were also uh, exclusive of other racial groups. So that kind of perpetuates some, some, some stuff. So, but. Um, just want to talk a little bit about this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so diversity is its commonalities and differences. Um, equity is recognizing that we have to do this extra stuff to make people have uh, similar outcomes. Um, equality is giving people all the same stuff. But I would suggest that inclusion is tearing down artificial barriers between people, right? So we can get rid of those barriers. Um, this is why we have paper. So um, let's go to page two. Um, go back to page two. What I'd like for you to do is just think about um, these groups of individuals and what what um, groups have given you information about these categories. Right. So the categories of groups of people. Um, so your racial group. Um, your gender, um, Native Americans, people with disabilities, LGBT uh, folks, and folks of other faiths. Right? So, what have um, your parents and family taught you about your race, about your gender, about Native Americans, or people with disabilities, or LGBT folks, or faith of other traditions? What have your friends said? Blah, 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 blah. And I want you to do that in a particular kind of way. What I want you to do is I want you to put a plus where you have had uh, positive um, interactions or they said positive things about those groups. I want you to put a minus where there have been negative conversations about those groups. Um, I want you to put a zero where you've never had a conversation about those groups. All right? So uh, pluses, minuses, and zeros. And you can have pluses and minuses in the same box, but the size matters. Right, so a big plus means lots of positive, and a little minus means um, a bit of negative. All right, so I'll give you just about a, a minute or so to, to do that. Right. Pluses, minuses, and zeros.
continue to, uh, to grab an elbow partner or a table partner and talk about your questions, your minuses, and your zeros. Please feel free to share what you want to share and don't share what you don't want to share uh, as, you, as you have a conversation. And I'll give about, uh, about three minutes for that conversation. All right?
second wrap up Pluses, minuses, and zeros. Was there anything that came up for you as you as you looked at how you have been trained to see the world? Um, was there anything that came up for folks who were looking at the task with pluses, minuses, and zeros? No, just just reflecting on uh, on our own pluses, minuses, and zeros. Yes. Well, we Yeah, on, on the first page, right? We did the triangles, right? What happens when we don't have the conversation? It, it gets ignored. Or they want to talk to them. Or we make stuff up, right? So so that that that's thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Right? What else do people recognize about their own plus and minus and zeros? Yes. Because you grew up in a different context than, say, myself, right? I can't speak for anybody else, but uh, I, I would assume that there are some assumptions people would make about us that about, about our experiences being similar. But I would I would suggest that, given our age, that our experiences may be totally, totally different in terms of how we even see the world on some particular thing, right? I mean, would you technically be a millennial? Z? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Just checking. I mean, I mean, like, people talk about what you study, you don't expect to say it's wrong. Like, um, like, you know, 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 like,
Yeah, so they bring their triangles to your home, right? Yeah. Other folks, what did you notice as you were going through those? This isn't a new revelation for me, but I, I feel like there's a biracial kid in seven. It's a new biracial in North of the seven. So I remember the elementary school not really having a group. Of course, my actual parents were really good about that. We forget, are. Forget them if they don't want to interact with people, whatever we do. Yep. But I remember very distinctly that, that you don't know, really, this is really what you need to do. Yeah, you definitely wanted to be here. I remember that dynamic. Yeah, yeah. The the other part of that dynamic is it's a, for my grandmother who grew up in this. Uh, she grew up in Alabama and she was a uh, very dark skinned woman. And we had biracial kids in our family. And my grandmother would always say, "Black is black." Right? Not recognizing, thinking, taking pride in that, but not not having the nuance to understand what that might mean for my cousins who also have another part of that like so it's great that they're black just like the rest of us but then yeah yeah so that that is certainly a, a conversation that we have now that we could be talking about today and so context is important and i would i would submit to you that context is actually everything if you don't understand a, a, a person's context you don't understand them because their behavior makes sense Within its context. Yeah. Other things that people notice about themselves or thought about that exercise. Would this be an exercise that would be helpful in the body in the body of your your offices? To at least be critical thinking. And and you tell people that you will have a bias, right? So so one thing that we don't have, and I'm saying we because I'm partly as if I'm one of you, which I am not, and I just want to be clear about that. But one one of one of the things that a luxury that you don't have is that you're never off. You are all because of the oath that you take, and you're always on. And so uh, it's interesting. I had some uh, some police officers who I didn't know were police officers until I got a subpoena to show up to defend their their stuff. Uh, they had taken one of my courses, and you know, and uh, it, it's an online course, and you did all the stuff. And I didn't know they were officers until I got a subpoena to defend them in, in some kind of case because they took my course and used that as a as a point to say that they weren't accused of doing what they did and um, and whatnot. But what, what they failed to realize was that they're never off. Right? So um, all of their behavior is, is catalog. And so um, so the kinds of stuff around the diversity stuff has to be more than just what I do at work or that the work is making me do it. But I have to start to provide that this is something that is necessary for a civil society. Um, and so we got to figure out how to do that stuff. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So one of the things that I, one of the places I find very um, difficult to interact with is media. Uh, it appears to me that media is really operating from this place in red, right? That, um, you know, a, a lot of kids who watch too much TV, come across shows like Cops and all its variations, right? Bad boys, bad boys, coming for you, you know. And most of us know that none of those, or, or many of those cases, uh, can never stand up because the cameras. Is that a is that a is that a true statement that many of those cases 
typically don't go to don't go anywhere other than TV that you know or that's probably true in general. In general, it's not the case. Okay. Okay. So, um, but but these short sitcoms and shows are really kind of hyper escalate all sorts of stuff because they can't tell a true story, right? And so um, they really try to keep us in this red zone. And so in terms of situational awareness, how long can we be in this red zone? How long can you expect your officers to be in that red zone? Not very long at all, right? However, we're constantly inundated by things, particularly in the media, that keep trying to drive us to this threat level of red. And so we're getting exhausted. You'll hear people say, you know, I'm tired of talking about diversity. And then you ask them some facts about diversity, and they don't know anything about diversity, but they're tired of hearing about it because they've just been inundated with so much information, right? And so the same thing is happening with us, that we can't live in this zone, and so we're constantly inundated with this stuff. So we have to be very critical in, um, in understanding some stuff. So I, I also have come to a realization that, that social justice isn't what I originally thought or I was originally told. I think it's, it's been modified and we need to think about it differently, right? So Adam Smith, so I go back to Adam Smith, who is uh, in, in American history, one of the early economists. And, and some of the stuff that he talks about is like the, um, the invisible hand, that the market itself will adjust and blah, blah, blah. What we know is that governments have tried to control that hand and manipulate markets for certain kinds of things, blah, 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 blah. But he talks about two things that I think are important. And one is justice and, and what he calls beneficence. And beneficence is this moral imperative to do good to other to do good to other people and for other people because it's good for me, right? And so when we think about this idea of, of justice, that's what I'd like for us to think about, particularly in social justice. We do things in, in social settings because it, it is good to do and it is good for others and it is good for me, as opposed to the soft um, kind of liberal way that folks have tried to use social justice to say that everybody needs to get exactly the same things and, and we need to manipulate systems to make sure that, that happens, what I would suggest is that we need to get to a place where we recognize that we are the community as, as, as peace officers, as um, um, our job is to be with the community to create this beneficence. Um, as opposed to being outside of it, trying to dictate, right? So uh, theories of, sort of, uh, of moral sentiment, moral constraint, feedback loops for good and bad behaviors. One of the, um, and you, you've heard these things, that community oftentimes uh, complains that there aren't, that they are concerned that officers don't or can't police themselves, right? That there aren't feedback loops. So, uh, part of that is telling the stories about what those feedback loops might be for, for our departments. Um, and then um, free will um, is this idea, is also part of this commitment, right? So we do this because, not because we're compelled to, but because, no, because we're compelled to, but we're not mandated to do those things. So, da 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 da. So that's some of my, my, um, my new stuff that I'm working on. So let's go to page three in your handout, which is this idea of cognitive control. So I want you to look at that picture um, entitled American Girl in Italy, and tell me what's going on in that picture. What's that? There's only one woman in the picture. She is the center of attention. And she's doing her best to ignore that intention. How, do you, how does it look like she feels about that intention? Not probably not comfortable, right? What might we call this in our modern day? Because this was what uh, 1950s. What might we call this in modern day? What's that? Cat calling. All right. What else might this be labeled as? 
What's that? Harassment. Harassment, right? Um, and particularly sexual harassment. So here is herein lies the problem. Is there anything that is happening in this picture that is illegal? No. Are there things in this picture that are happening that aren't quote unquote right? That aren't helpful for the growth and development of human of human beings? One could argue, yes, possible, right? But there's nothing illegal happening here. What's the point? So when we talk about, particularly uh, when I did affirmative action stuff at, at, at the county and other places, we would talk about the difference between impact and impact, right? So impact, the law measures impact, right? There are certain things you cannot do. Now, what would, what kinds of things would, would cross the line and make this illegal? Make illegal activity happen here? If someone had touched her, right? What else? Certain kinds of comments, right? Um, and people get the First Amendment confused because they don't understand the context, right? What's the context of, of the, the First Amendment? The government. That's the context, right? So you can say whatever you want to say against the government without retribution, but we've taken that and really stretched it out of, out of proportion. But that's a whole other conversation. Right. Um, so, so impact is important. So people will will, will say, I I didn't. Um, you can't take a joke, right? And I don't know if you've ever heard someone say that and they make some kind of derogatory remark about a, a, another group of people or another gender or another way of being. And they say, Well, you just can't take a joke. Well, some jokes. You're right. I can't take. Right? Um, because it's the impact that matters. So, so a, a person walks uh, down the hall and someone swats them on the behind and they're not in the softball team together. What do we call that? We call that harassment, right? And, and sexual harassment. Now, what if the person, um, and so then what happens next? What typically would happen next in, a, in, in, in either your organization or another organization? What would be the next step? If someone did that and they reported it, what would be the next step? An investigation, formal interview, and so forth and so on. And so as they're going down this, this, this process, what if the, the perpetrator says, <laughs> I was just kidding? Does that change anything about the process? No, it doesn't. Why? Because we're measuring impact, right? So when we're so when we're having these interactions, we, we have to have cognitive control and recognize that our behaviors have consequences. But also, intention is very important as well. But intention comes after impact, right? So when we think about this idea of, of intention, it's really about personal relationships. How many of you have ever received or given a macaroni sculpture? <laughs> or made a tie or made a thing, right? When that is given or received, where does that thing go? Where's the place of honor in the home where many of those things end up? On the refrigerator, right? For all to see, right? Why? Why does it go to that place of honor? Why don't we put it on Etsy or eBay? Why don't we try to sell it? Because you have a connection with the person who gave you, right? So intention only matters when we're in relationship with one another. So, um, so we go to a call and it's an aggressive thing. We have to take control of it. Do they care how much I'm, how much I care? No, I have to go in and take take control of that situation, right? So my impact will be large. But what would ever happen if I came back later after things had settled down and I came back and I said, we knew, work with you. We knew that that was a, that must have been scary for all you guys. How's everybody doing? We, we took care of the situation. How's everybody doing? How might that change how people see what we do, right? 
So, so intentions do matter, and that's how we build those relationships, right? We take kind of control. Um, at this, uh, here's a car, and we obviously know where the blind spots are in the car, right? Um, and anybody drive a Hummer? Okay, because the whole thing is a blind spot. Right? <laughs> the Hummer is a blind spot in and of itself, right? Are those blind spots in the cars that we drive, are they our fault? Are we to blame for those blind spots? So if you've created one or added to it, okay, so a, a, a car that you've ever driven, have you ever added to that blind spot? Some well, of you might have a, one of those fifth floor trailers on the back, that might, that might kind of be bad. But most of the cars we drive have blind spots that we did not, we did not create. So it's not our fault, but it is our what? Responsibility, right? So when we talk about diversity and inclusion stuff, we're not talking about fault and blame and shame and trying to make people feel feel bad. We're talking about what.